I, I mean, I really do tell like new hairstylists, like you are not going to make money for a long time. Until you get a specialty or a certain clientele. Exactly. Yeah. Or just a bunch of people or anything. Yeah. But once you're there, it's very steady and very, I guess, recession proof. Like right now I'm booked out 10 weeks, you know? So it's like, whatever happens, at least I know I can work for the next 10 weeks and make money. How much do you love your hair? Enough to spend $600 a month on touch-ups? Enough to dye it wild colors and have rainbow hair become so much a part of your identity, you can't even remember what your natural hair color is. My guest, Maggie Wolbert, lives in that world. My name is Maggie Murray. My married name is Maggie Wolbert, and I am a vivid hair colorist. Maggie lives in Tacoma, Washington. She's what's known as a vivid artist, a hairstylist specializing in giving people super bright, electric, colorful hair. She told me about how she turned a middle finger to corporate dress codes and how she carved out space for herself in a tough industry. Now she's looking at buying a home and, of course, some Taylor Swift tickets. I'm Maya Lau, and this is Other People's Pockets, the show where I ask people about their money so the questions we all have about how much other people make and how their finances work can be a little bit less of a mystery. So why vivid hair? You know, because it's fun. After you do the same job for so many years, I think it's with any job, it gets repetitive and... Uh, maybe boring for lack of a better word, but vivid hair color is bright. It's fun. It's exciting. Every single time it's different, you know, keeps it interesting. It's so cool. Like looking at your Instagram feed, like it looks amazing. Thanks. It is fun. (laughs) Come to the dark side. The bright (laughs) side, I guess. Yeah, the bright side. I will consider it. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Did you start it when you were already doing hair like you you were already a hairstylist and then did you morph into vivid hair or yeah it was like a it was like a slow a slow morph I would say I've been doing hair since like 2009 um you know obviously in beauty school they teach you the basics you're doing your highlights your perms your color retouches just like your basic stuff and then thrown in there there's like fun little projects and I I've I had pink hair since I was 15 years old for and I had it forever so I think I attracted a certain type of clientele, and I think, you know, my friends, doing my friends' hair, they wanted a little color here and there, and it slowly just, like, snowballed into that's primarily what I do at this point. I would also imagine, though, your clientele is younger-ish, so imagining, like, they don't have a ton of grays. Yeah, that's true. Because I'm imagining some of your clients are, like, Gen Z or younger millennial people that aren't people in their 50s with like a super established like corporate career. I would say my clientele ranges anywhere from like 18 to mid early to mid 40s. So kind of I mean I'm 31, I'm almost 32, so and you know, basically my my age I guess. But I guess I'm getting older. So there are I do have a lot of 20-year-olds. <laughs> so like how do they afford that? Um so I do have a lot of like girls that work in like do you guys know what bikini barista stands are? Yeah. So I used to live in Seattle. Oh, okay. So you're very (laughs) Um, well aware. Yeah. So for people who don't know, it's a like little tiny kiosk in like random parking lots with a barista, but she's in a bikini. Yeah. If that even. And apparently the coffee is super expensive Mm -hmm. and it's not particularly good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they just get money thrown at them. I have a handful of girls that are in that. And so they... They have money. I, they have money. They're 20 to, you know, 25 years old, and they are, like, raking in cash. They pay me in cash a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I also... I've also noticed my girls that don't, that aren't in the industry, they just work, like, normal jobs, like, in their retail and stuff like that. They, I think, getting their hair done is just their, like, one thing that they splurge right. on. right. Anything, like, racially in terms of who's getting this done? I would say most of my clientele is white, probably 80%, um, which I think there's, I don't know what it is, but I think a lot of people of color think that they can't have hair like that because of their hair texture, which is not true at all. But it can be, like, tough on your hair, right? 
Okay. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. It's not so much texture; it's more of like the actual thickness of your hair strand that matters. So people, some people have baby fine hair, and if you put bleach on it, it is it's going to stay on your head, but it's not going to feel good, you know. Um, but people that have thicker, coarser hair, you're able to do a little more damage on it, right? Lighten it a few more times to get where it needs to be, and it's gonna it's gonna hold on. Okay. What should I not be buying at Target? shampoo wise like what's just like a dumb like please don't do that to your hair you're gonna like really hate this answer but truly everything at target you should not be using on your hair you want to buy um like professional products from a hair salon essentially even ooh, this is a whole thing diversion within the hair care industry or hair industry if you see a salon brand on a shelf at target it is expired or completely not the same product at all. So people go in thinking like, oh, I saw this brand at my salon on the shelf. I'm going to buy it here. It's cheaper. And it's not the same thing. Um, You have to buy it from like a trusted salon because a lot of those things are filled with sulfates and like waxes, literal floor wax that will like coat your hair and make it seem and look and feel shiny and healthy. But what it's doing, it's putting like a layer on your hair and coating it. And your actual hair underneath is like dying. It's dehydrated. It is, there's a coating on it now. So it's just like drying the heck out underneath that. And I understand people have different budgets and some people just straight up don't care if they have no problems with their hair and it works for them. Great. That's kind of how I feel about box dye too. It's like, if you've been doing the same box color for 15 years and it works for you and you like how it looks, great. Keep doing that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like getting your hair done is a luxury for sure. And some people just don't see it as a luxury and that's okay. Do you remember how your family thought about money? Like, did you get messages from your parents, whether they told you anything or not, or like whether you just picked it up? I don't think so. And now that I'm like, you're asking me these questions, I'm like, this is kind of strange that I don't have like any financial memories. I don't know. It was just never a topic in my household. Why do you think it was that your family didn't talk about money? I think it may have been a taboo thing or my parents trying to protect me and my brother. Um, There was a, like, looking back as an adult, there were a lot of things that they, I think, protected us from. Like, to this day, I don't even know why they divorced. I have an idea, but they never let us see that side of their relationship, even when they were, like, arguing and stuff like that. So I think they tried to hide a lot of, like, bad stuff from us, which I appreciate because if we, if we did have financial struggles, I, I didn't know about them. I don't know if that was just being naive and, like, being a literal child. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, so I don't know. We could have been going through something financial and I didn't, I wouldn't even know. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. My parents divorced when I was in third grade. And so at that point, finances split. Um, And I know now as an adult, after like talking with my parents, like my mother was a teacher on a teacher's salary with two kids. You know what I mean? So it was definitely more difficult for her than my father. And, you know, my father moved into like a tiny apartment for a while Actually, okay, now that we're talking about this, my dad moved into, like, a really crappy apartment in, like, Federal Way, and it was, like, very, like, run down. And I remember thinking, like, oh, this is weird and, like, a little uncomfortable for me. You know, the house that I grew up in, I had my own bedroom. My older brother had his own bedroom. And then we would have to go over there every other weekend um, until we were 18. And he was in a one-bedroom apartment. And so my brother and I would both have to share the bed on, like, the pull-out couch, and it, like, sunk in in the middle. You know what I'm talking about? The worst. So I'd, like, wake up next to my brother, and I'm like, ugh, like, get off me. Like, it was it was uncomfortable compared to then just going home and, like, being in our own separate bedrooms and rooms. The apartment did have a pool, which mm. was kind of lit. That was probably the only highlight to that entire situation. <laughs> but I'm guessing my dad, you know, the, the second he moved out, is probably at the time the only thing he could afford Ford. I think he was only there for a year or two, but it's probably the only thing he could afford or it was just the easiest thing he could get into. Did your mom keep the place where you had been living before? Yeah. Okay. My parents got divorced when I was nine. Mm -hmm. Like my dad got a different place. 
and he was able to buy a house. Um, but the, these were the days when like houses weren't as expensive um, because that couldn't happen now. Like you couldn't like get divorced. Like I'm just going to go buy another house. Like, no big myself. deal. I'll just get another one. <laughs> that does not exist. <laughs> right. Like, yeah, I remember it was like, this is, this is different. Mm -hmm. It was not, it wasn't my home. It wasn't my home. Yeah. Yeah. How much money do you make? This is kind of a funny question because I can't really give you an answer. <laughs> I'm so bad with this, but I have an accountant and he does literally everything. I can tell you how much the business brings in. Oh, okay. I have like an LLC and so I have the business, but then I have all my business expenses. So the way I pay myself every, I pay myself once every two weeks and it varies depending on how busy those two weeks were. Mm -hmm. So... The last year, my business brought in ninety five thousand, and this year, I think I'm my accountant's projecting like one fifteen. Okay, and so I would maybe whatever like all the taxes are, and then the cost of my rent at the salon because I'm a chair, I lease a chair, um, and then all the products take all of that away, and then that's what I'm left with. And how do you how do you feel about that? I feel good about it now. Um, I'm like finally comfortable money wise. Um, my first, I would say, five or six years of doing hair, and actually, it was all when I was an employee for for a salon. Before I started working for myself, uh, I was not making any money. Like, I think my first couple of years of doing hair annually, I I made like twenty thousand dollars or something. Hmm. But that was when I was working for, like, corporate salons first. I was young. I was 19, 20 years old. And I was like, whatever, as long as I'm, like, paying my rent, I don't need money, you know? But the older I got, I'm like, oh, no, no. I need I need to profit from this more. And then the second I switched over to working for myself, um, that's when I really saw a difference in how much money I made. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I love that. Like, I love how, like— betting on yourself can be like yeah. the ticket. It's like, oh, I actually have the skills and I have the network. Like I don't need I don't need a corporate. Right. You know, or a corporation. Yeah. I it's really freaking scary. It's very scary because you need to have the clientele to support that. Um I had some friends right out of beauty school that jumped right into chair renting and they like tanked. They like because they, they didn't have a clientele a yet, right? They didn't have a clientele. And it just doesn't make sense. Do you have any kind of goal amount that's like, this year, I'd really like to make X? And like, if so, like, why do you arrive at that number? To be honest, it's when I have meetings with my accountant. Every year we have like a business planning meeting, essentially. It's normally actually this time of year, like in November, we meet and he kind of looks over my numbers up until that point and... uh projects what I should strive for the next year. And every single year, I've been working with him for like five years. And ever since then, every year I've met it. So he gives me a number and I'm like, all right, like, let's go. Let's let's do it. And I, I use um, like Square to run my business and they are really good at giving you reports on everything. You can look up any specific number and detail for anything. So I'm always looking at my weekly reports, my monthly reports, and I have a certain number in my head that I need to meet weekly in order to meet my monthly in order to meet the year, mm -hmm. you know? So I kind of just track those. How do you figure out, like, how much you get to charge or want to charge? <laughs> I don't know if there's a correct answer, but every few years I will up my prices just based off of in general inflation. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and then I also base it off of, I work in a big salon right now. There's like 20 stylists and about half of us are chair renters. And so I, we talk with each other and ask like what, a, you know, what we're charging. Some people charge hourly. Some people charge like a la carte. Um, I kind of have an upper hand where I am one of, like I'm a specialist. So I'm one of the only people in my area that offers what I offer at the quality so I think I am expensive in comparison to some people, 
but I also have the experience, like, and the talent to support that and back it. You know what I mean? Why not charge by the project? Like, why not just be like, this is going to be $2,000. Yeah. It just is what it is. I did that for a while, and um, it's more difficult when when you get into the vivid colors compared to just, like, this is the price of highlights, you know? Uh, it's, it's, it varies so drastically client to client. So if I was like, okay, like a vivid hair color, $400, it might be $400 for one client, but then somebody comes in with hair to their literal butt. And then I have to like measure every single thing I use to the T and like charge accordingly. And it's honestly like so much work on the back end, so much more work to do that. Whereas if I just have a broad, like, hey, this is how much it's going to cost an hour, uh, if it's excessive, it'll be a little bit more than that. And it's just so much easier to calculate that way for me personally. I do have coworkers that do it the complete opposite and that works for them. Like I have a friend, she doesn't work with me anymore, but um, her main thing is extensions. She does extensions and she makes so much money from extensions. And so that's actually something I'm going to work into my business next year. I'm learning how to do them and I'm going to start offering that to my clients because it's another way to make more money and also just expands my clientele. How much are extensions? Oh, they're expensive. It depends on like where who does it and like what hair and what technique you have. But like the hair that I have in right now, the hair itself cost about $600. And that was like at, you know, hairstylist cost. You can, you can double that charge for clients. So they would pay $1,200 just for the hair. Mm-hmm. And then the installation, uh, she charges... $500 for the initial installation. And then every five weeks, you have to move them up on your head, which mm. costs $400. So like, it's a it's a lot of money. It's more money than uh, even my clients pay. Right. And it's quick. The, the actual service is very quick. It's an hour to an hour and a half. She can make like $1,500. That's, that's where it's at. I know. I know. I'm learning that. So that's why I'm like, okay, I got to get on this. Time is money. Time is money. <laughs> Does hair go in line with economic downturns? You know, like now that we're like in a recession or like inflation is so high, right? And like, do you see like, oh, like people are dropping off or like, does the colors change or what people want? Like, is that reflected in hair at all? As an industry, I don't think it is because the one thing that doesn't stop when you don't have as much money as your hair keeps growing. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. They're going to get rid of their facials and their massages and, like, their gym memberships first. That is so interesting. I know, which is great for me. So they're going to keep getting their hair cut. Right. Like, people are not going to, like, suddenly look either like shit or, like, not like themselves or not like yeah. how they are used to looking. Exactly. They're going to get rid of the stuff that is not 100% necessary. I have noticed that, um, especially, like, right after we started working after the pandemic. So that was like June of 2020. Everybody had these like long ass roots. Um, We call them quarantine roots, Mm -hmm. which some people (laughs) were so happy to get rid of and get taken care of. And then some people leaned into it and they were like, is there any way we can like blend this? And so some people Mm -hmm. get, they'll, they'll kind of meet in the middle. Well, they'll have like a, they'll transition to a more manageable, less maintenance, you know, green hair, but Mm. it's green hair nonetheless. So instead of having to come in every six weeks, you add a root to it and then they come in every 12 weeks instead. And you said like the maintenance upkeep is like 600 a month, but is there like an initial amount that if if you're getting this done from scratch and is that a lot more? Yeah. So say somebody comes in with like, you know, long, dark virgin hair, or even they have color on it and you have to lighten the whole thing. I'll be with them for eight hours sometimes, anywhere from like seven to 10 hours for that first initial appointment. Wow. And I charge 105 an hour. So whatever that math is, and that's a starting price. If they have like excessive hair and I have to use, you know, so much more product, it'll go up from there as well. So so like 105 an hour for like eight hours is like $840. Mm-hmm. But it could be more if it's more hours. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It could be more. Yeah. Just depending. That's, I always say it like starts at that price. Do you feel like anyone taught you about money? No, not at all. <laughs> not within my family, not within the school system. Like, no. How do you feel like you've figured out 
whatever it is that you've figured out? It's been a complete guessing game and really relying on my other like fellow hairstylists to see Mm -hmm. what they're doing. There's Mm -hmm. kind of no like, there's no rule book or like, I guess like guidebook on how to become an independent hairstylist. Mm -hmm. It is, it's completely a guessing game. (laughs) But also what about like in your personal finances, like just figuring out like how much you should be saving or like if you should be saving for retirement or like any of that? I don't have retirement or 401k or anything like that. Um, For me and my husband personally, all of our paychecks that we get, we put away 15% into savings. And we also started a Roth something. A Roth IRA? Yeah. And for anyone who doesn't know, that's a type of individual retirement account. Yeah. We started one of those that my husband and I pay into. He does most of our budgeting stuff. He's on the computer every day looking at our finances and like moving stuff around. So I trust him to do (laughs) most of that. Mm -hmm. Being with my husband, my husband grew up poor. And so he has a completely different idea about money than I do. If I have like a chunk of change and it's just sitting in my bank account and there's something like that I could, that I want that I could pay for with it, I have no problem just buying it, but I also think that's the Taurus in me. Mm, yeah, you like nice things. I like to indulge. Yeah. I like nice things, um, but I've never been in debt. Like, I think there's something in my head that stops me where I'm like, oh, well, I can't have that thing, even if I paid with, like, a credit card. Mm-hmm. So you do you not have any debt? Mm, no, other than, like, my car payment, you know, my cars and stuff like that, but no. That's awesome. Yeah, um, I think my husband's taught me a lot of that about how to use like our credit cards smartly and paying them off every month and whatever. Because he never had money, now that he does, he likes to be very smart with it, and he's taught me that. Yeah, like liter- literally next week, Taylor Swift tickets are going on sale. Oh. And the last time she came to town, I did a very bad tourist thing, and I ended up buying four pairs because I kept finding better seats that were more expensive. And it was and it was literally like three thousand dollars later. I like landed on my pair, and I'm like, I can't do that. I can't just spend three thousand dollars on Taylor Swift tickets, <laughs> even if I resell them. I can't be doing that. You know what I mean? So I have learned. I'm trying to you be have a limits. little yeah. smarter. I have <laughs> limits. Uh, yeah. So he's he teaches me a lot how to handle our finances. That's really interesting. Like my husband also like we talk a lot about like how our upbringing yeah has really informed like the way we look at money and anxiety about money yeah. and and feeling like like there's certain things that for both of us feel like oh well I couldn't afford like I like literally like I just moved mm-hmm. and we had movers that pack everything for you in part because it was an international move we moved to Mexico City oh wow um and you and you have to because of the customs they they like need everything to be organized in a certain way. But like these people came for one day and did it all for us. Like, I don't think of myself as somebody who could afford that. Yeah. But you were able to. We were. I mean, it was not cheap, but it was kind of necessary because of the customs thing. Yeah. But like, yeah, it's just interesting how it's like, oh, well, like, actually, we kind of can afford this now, but I'm not used to to doing that kind of thing. Absolutely. <laughs> like, I've, I've never paid for movers. And the last time we moved, we were like, next time we're paying for this. Do you have any anxieties about money? Not as much as my husband. I think any anxieties I do have come from him. <laughs> <laughs> like projecting onto me. How does that show up in your marriage? Um, it shows up in our marriage by me spending more than he wants me to. <laughs> mm. And my husband always tells me, or he tells other people rather, he's like, I am the one that stresses out about money. But uh, like if, if Maggie says like we can afford to do this thing, like I'm also going to trust her because it's worked out so far. You know, anytime we like, plan a trip or something um and he's like are you sure we can afford it and I'll kind of like look at stuff and I'm like yeah like we can make it happen and then once we're back from said trip he's like oh my god I'm so happy we did that I'm so happy it worked out like thank you you know so it's kind of like putting trust in in each other give and take a little bit I'm curious if there's anything else that like you indulge in like it kind of doesn't matter how much it costs like you're gonna buy it 
Um, I travel a lot for concerts. We're a big music family. My husband is a musician, so we travel for festivals a lot. That's probably the biggest expense, I would say. And I get my nails done and I get massages and facials and whatever. What class do you consider yourself a part of now? Middle class, for sure. Mm -hmm. Like working middle class. Yeah. Because my my husband's very like blue collar. Mm -hmm. Okay. What does enough look like to you? If you would have asked me a year ago, I would have been like, I'm okay. I have enough right now with where I'm at in life. But my husband and I are hoping to purchase a house in the next few months. Well, probably like six months or so. And so we're definitely like hustling right now to be able to prepare ourselves to be ready for that big jump because that's a huge, the biggest financial thing we've ever done so far. So as of like right now in this moment, I feel like I don't have enough for that to happen. Yeah. I mean, especially with housing, it's like if you didn't want a house, yeah, you'd be fine. But like once you throw a house into the equation, it's like there's no way to feel you have enough. It's like, okay, I can't, I don't have a million dollars. Yeah. I feel like I know people in Tacoma who've gotten like four to $500,000 homes. I mean, I, I realize like in different parts of the country, that's still considered a lot, but like, but, but yeah, it's like, there's no way to feel like you have enough. Cause it's like, these prices insane. are, they don't make any sense. Literally like, insane. We kind of have a saving grace where, because my husband remodels homes for a living, like his pipe dream is to get a fixer-upper anyways. Yeah, that's also such a great position to be in. Yeah, because then we won't have to pay for labor or anything. So once we do make the jump, I think it'll be a little easier for us to get in than other people um, because we have that advantage. But it's still, it's like to get a three-bedroom, one- or two-bathroom house in Tacoma, like that's decent and not falling apart is four to $500,000, which is... That's a lot of money. What's your house budget? What are you guys looking at right now when you punch it into Zillow? We're looking at like 450. And so that's considering that you'll still need to make improvements to it? No, actually. That was like that was like newer homes. Has anything really negative or really positive ever happened to you around money? Okay, so business-wise, I was just talking to my husband about this the other night. Um it sounds really bad and I feel bad saying this, but because of the pandemic, like 2020, once we started working again, even though I missed three months of work because we weren't allowed to work for 12 weeks, 2020, I made the most money I like ever have total. Mm. It boosted my business big time. And it was so, and I hate saying that because 2020 was such an awful year for like so many people. Yeah. Um, personally or fi- financially, whatever. But it was like a really, really good year for my business and then like me and my husband. And that's the year my husband started his company as well um, because hmm. he got laid off from all of his jobs because of COVID. Mm-hmm. And so he, that's when he started his own business and that took off. And so it's, yeah, I hate saying that, but like COVID really helped us financially. <laughs> I feel like that is a COVID story. I feel like there was like record numbers of new business filings and like people being like all right I'm gonna go out on my own and they did it and like for a lot of people it worked it's weird yeah it is it is weird to think about what happens when you I don't know want to slow down or be more flexible or retire So I would say three-year plan right now. I'm going to manifest it. I will open my own salon. Nice. Um, Because I've been doing this for like going on 14 years now. My body is messed up from it. I, As much as I would love to do hair forever, I just know that I won't be able to. Um, Especially with like in the next couple of years, we want to start having children and stuff. And so I'll need to figure out a way how to step back from behind the chair, but still make as much money, if not more, you mm-hmm. know? Um, so I really, yeah, I'm, I'm going to open my own salon. Uh, my best, my very best friend, she does hair as well. We work in the same spot together. And so we will open something of our own. Our plan is to find a space, make it as cool as we want it. And hopefully we'll have other stylists in there that I will be able to make money from monthly while they are making money for the salon and themselves. And slowly step back from behind the chair and do stuff more behind the scenes and just running 
the business, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And uh, as far as like retirement stuff like that, I don't. There, I we still have a lot of stuff we need to, to figure out because there's nothing. There's nothing set up for independent stylist like myself, even for like healthcare. Like I don't. I don't have healthcare right now. Mm. Not even through your husband. No, because he's independent too. He owns his own business. I'm in this weird spot where, like, I make too much money to get, like, state assistance. Right. But I don't make enough where for the amount they want me to pay. Like, I think the last time we checked for the both of us, it was, like, $800 a month or something. Which I'm like, if I had an extra $800 a month to just spend, I would be driving away right. a nicer car. should raise your prices and get health care. <laughs> like, I know. Like, you're, Girl, a you're, good, you're in a me. good position. I know. And I pro- I could. I And I am. Actually, at the beginning of the year, this time of year is actually the best time for stylists to raise their prices because people are already in the money spending mindset with the holidays. Oh. You know? So this is like from November to January is when all hairstylists should up their prices. It's like cold, you're hunkering down. Like yeah. maybe you're not going out as much or maybe you are going out more because it's cold. But like, it's just really interesting to hear you say that, like, I would, I would, I would have thought, like, summer yeah, would be when people are, like, I want to, like, look hot and... Totally. I see why you would think that, but in my experience with, at least with my clientele, summer is actually slower huh. because people are going on their summer vacations. So right. they'd rather spend their money and they're just gone. Gone. You yeah. know, they're not even, like, in town. Um People are home and want to look good for their holidays, and they're already spending all this money on Christmas presents and whatever. So I always up my prices, and people don't even, like, bat an eye at it. Wow. Yeah. How do you decide, like, when to work or, like, your schedule or— um, So I work four days a week right now, and— That is mostly based off of, like, how I feel when I work five days a week. I want to die. Like, just adding an extra day onto that, it really takes a toll on, like, my body and my mental well-being. Right. And so, right now, I work four days a week. Mm -hmm. And with my schedule right now, I'm able to meet the, like, criteria that my me and my accountant have gone over for myself for the goal. Like, I'll make my goals if I work four days a week at my, I charge hourly, like I said. So like at my hourly rate, I make what I need to. Can you talk about the physical toll that doing hair takes on your body? Yes. My body is falling apart. Um, Since I would say my fourth or fifth year of doing hair, I developed tendonitis in both of my shoulders from holding up my arms all day and blow drying. So I'm forever having tension here. And then um, just since the uh, since like 2020, I developed cubital tunnel syndrome in my left arm, which is, it's basically carpal tunnel, but it's on the other part of your hand. So it's my outer two fingers, my pinky and my ring finger, the outside of my arm, and then like kind of traveled up to like m- pretty much my shoulder. Um, it goes completely numb and it kind of feels like when your foot falls asleep and you shake it off, but you can't shake it off. It's like this uncomfortable, like numbing, sometimes tingling sensation. I also, in the last six months, I developed um, golfer's elbow, which is... Like a repetitive motion thing? Yeah, it is so painful. And so I I get massages once a month and um, it's not like relaxing massages. It's more so it's like medically it's exactly exactly <laughs> yeah. my uh, massage therapist is an angel and she took it upon herself to actually learn a lot about um, cubital tunnel and she like bought certain tools and stuff to like and she works on my arms I mostly go in to get my arms worked on and it hmm. freaking hurts it's not like it's not comfortable the entire time um, sometimes I even bruise from it but it relieves so much pain and it's so necessary and um, I know a lot of my other colleagues have gotten surgeries for it. You have to get, a lot of people get carpal tunnel surgery or cubital tunnel surgery. So I'm trying to avoid surgery at this point because I don't have health insurance and it's just scary. If I can do other things to help it out in the meantime, why wouldn't I, you know? So that's just another, I guess that's, yeah, that's another expense. Your body falls apart. And people tell you early on in your career, like there's so many certain things that you can do, um, while you're working to hold your body to like prevent those injuries from happening. But I think we lose sight of that the longer you 
are doing hair. And so you start doing hair. Well, and anything, anything you're doing, like you can mitigate it. Mm-hmm. But like if you're in a certain position all day, yeah. like there's not much you can yeah, do. No amount of like yoga or whatever. Exactly. And so is there kind of like a, a cutoff date for like, you know, past certain age, like you kind of can't people kind of can't do this anymore or as much with as much frequency. I think so. I think that's why you don't see a lot of 70 year old hairstylists. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta, you can't last too long. And do you see yourself having vivid hair your entire life till you're like a hundred? I like weirdly do. Yeah. I feel like it would be weird if you didn't like. (laughs) It would be be weird. (laughs) Maggie, thank you so much for talking to me today. This has been a total delight. Of course. This is fun. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Other People's Pockets. If you like our show, consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It really, really helps us out. Other People's Pockets is written and hosted by me, Maya Lau. It's produced by me, along with Joy Sanford and Dan Gallucci. Production help by Angela Vang. Our mix engineer is Dan Gallucci. Our executive producers are me, along with Jane Marie and Dan Gallucci. Special thanks to Divorce Dads doing their best. Other People's Pockets is a co-production of Pushkin Industries and Little Everywhere. If you love this show, consider subscribing to Pushkin Plus, offering bonus content and ad-free listening across our network for $4.99 a month. Look for the Pushkin Plus channel on Apple Podcasts or at pushkin.fm. To find more Pushkin podcasts, listen on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. You can sign up for Pushkin newsletters at pushkin.fm. You can find Maggie on Instagram at Hair Nirvana, and you can find me on Twitter at Maya Lau or on Instagram and TikTok at It's Maya Money. And one more thing, we really want to hear your voices. This week, we want to know what are some professions that seem lucrative yet aren't? And why do you think it is that people assume that this line of work makes a lot of money? And what is the reality? Leave us a voicemail at 323-540-4255. That's 323-540-4255. Or you can record a voice memo on your phone and email it to us at otherpeoplespockets at gmail.com. 